Hey folks, welcome back. Today we're talking about one of my favorite, favorite subjects, uh, butyrate and digestive health. So you'll hear me kind of mention butyrate, short chain fatty acids, frequently recommend prebiotic supplementation to my patients with digestive health symptoms. Um, you know, different conditions, you know, maybe I'll focus stronger on butyrate production and getting that up off the ground. It's a common treatment aim, supporting those beneficial bugs to produce butyrate, this short chain fatty acid. And you know, you might hear it, you might not know much about it. So I thought I would put together a little brief introduction on short chain fatty acids, specifically butyrate, which is a type of short chain fatty acid, its impact on digestive health and you know, health of the body in general. So let's get into it. I've got a link to an article on the website below. If you wanna follow along, check it out later. There's some references and just wanted to mention, you know, this is a couple years old, this, this article, and this little section of science and digestive health science is just exploding. You could read just for the rest of your life on the importance of butyrate, short chain fatty acids, how it's impacted in different digestive diseases for sure. It's an introduction, keep that in mind and really strong, strong focus on butyrate specifically. So what are short chain fatty acids? There are a handful of them, but the three kind of most uh, studied, best known, most impactful on health would be butyrate, right up there, acetate and propionate. And when we're testing the stool, as you can see in this video here, we can see um, you know, amounts of these different short chain fatty acids in the stool. Huge, huge, huge marker of digestive health, particularly when butyrate's low. If it's lab low and significantly lab low, that is a smoking gun if someone is dealing with digestive health. Getting butyrate up off the floor naturally, we're talking generally around fiber fermentation. And I have a really big emphasis on prebiotics in the clinic. I want to do a pretty kind of deep dive on prebiotics with you guys. They're poorly understood. Number one, I see a lot of misinformation, a lot of comments, you know, a lot of kind of, oh, prebiotics are contraindicated here or here, you know, specifically things like SIBO. And I agree, you know, we have to tread lightly. There's huge value in bringing in prebiotic fibers which selectively and exclusively feed beneficial bugs. And then the knock-on effect would be something like increased butyrate production naturally in your gut. And so we'll talk about the consequences, but that's one way to get it up off the ground. So bacteria can actually turn fiber into fats, short chain fatty acids. The higher the pH of your large bowel, the more alkaline your large bowel, the more less friendly bugs, a lot of these gram negative pro-inflammatory bacteria can proliferate. They like that environment. A patient will come to me and they'll say, look, I've got Klebsiella. We gotta hit it, we gotta kill it, right? And you might go in there with kind of selective targeted herbal antimicrobials to get some kind of early wins and some runs on the board. But the whole goal, if you do see this kind of pattern of dysbiosis, bacterial imbalance represented by an excessive amount of pro-inflammatory bacteria, the whole goal is to lower the pH of the large bowel so that it's not favoring those bugs. It's a little bit of a kind of tweak, you know, we're taught, you know, antibiotics for infections, right? Or overgrowth. And I see a lot of patients come to me and they've done a lot of antibiotics and they're not getting any better. They're actually getting worse. And I think a major, major piece right there is they're doing damage to a lot of their beneficial bacteria in their large bowel and they're losing and reducing their ability to produce Butyrate. It's produced by a whole raft of bacteria. Here we go here, we've just got, you know, a summary of, of some of them. It's probably not all of them. And to me, I think that is a huge benefit, right? So there are redundancies in the microbiome, as in one function is 
supplied or, or, or provided for by a number of different bacteria. If you've been exposed to antibiotics, maybe when you were quite young, or maybe you did three antibiotics at once, or maybe you did a long-term kind of antibiotic protocol, and you've killed off some of these bugs, there's a good chance that we still have some of them that we can selectively feed up bring online to produce more butyrate. So if we're talking about fibers that feed these bacteria to produce butyrate, you know, it's a whole stepwise process, um, I like to focus on soluble fibers. There are some insoluble fibers and you know, fiber blends, things like psyllium husk, uh, do have some soluble fibers that can feed some of these bugs. But the, the uh, soluble fiber that I'll start with, with the majority of my patients, depending on their symptoms and their tolerance, uh, their history is a big piece, would be partially hydrolyzed guar gum, or PHGG. Very well tolerated, very low FODMAP, very, very effective at getting a selective amount of these bugs, very targeted, up off the ground, to produce fed, you know, increased. <laughs> you feed them what they love and they grow. It's a surprise. Um, this has been pretty well studied by um, the Stanford University team led by uh, Erica and Justin Sonnenberg. They have become hyper focused on what they would you know, name in some of their papers as microbiota accessible carbohydrates or max for short and it's basically these carbs sometimes these complex carbs found in food a lot of kind of FODMAPs are types of microbial accessible carbohydrates they can feed good guys but the problem with FODMAPs is they tend to flare symptoms in patients who have digestive uh, symptoms so again starting off with low FODMAP prebiotics easing into the plan, building up that ecosystem, reducing some of these unfriendly bugs with herbs and with probiotics can be a really helpful way just to shift that uh, ecosystem population into balance. And then once you get that butyrate production up and the gut pH down, <laughs> right, um, you can see that you get a little bit of momentum and out and away from the symptoms. So some of the benefits of short chain fatty acids, most um, notably butyrate, be decreasing the colonic pH. We're talking large bowel here, just discuss that. That inhibits the growth of pathogens and bacterial overgrowth, fungal overgrowth as well. It's huge. It's kind of like a roundabout antimicrobial in a weird and kind of wacky way. Um, it improves the integrity and the function of colonic epithelial cells. What does that mean? Colonocytes are the cells that line the large bowel and butyrate is the primary fuel source for those cells. If you think about the small bowel, you know, everyone's really kind of familiar with glutamine. You got leaky gut, take more glutamine. Butyrate is the glutamine of the large bowel. Once you get a sufficient amount of butyrate up off the ground, you can see an improvement in insulin sensitivity. So there's probably some knock on there with diabetics, type one, type two, really important to have that large bowel producing an excessive amount of butyrate. And it also inhibits pro-inflammatory cytokines. So we discussed how butyrate feeds and keeps the cells that line the large bowel happy and healthy, but it also inhibits the proliferation of cancerous cells in the large bowel as well. So when am I considering butyrate supplementation? I would be jumping straight Right on an actual butyrate supplement if we see a lab low butyrate on stool testing that's pretty big we want to just jump straight to the case I would also consider it if someone has been extremely exposed to antibiotics I have seen a few cases where the gut microbiome has become so dysregulated that even if the beneficial bugs are there they're not fermenting the fiber to produce the butyrate after all that's a really big piece right there and the other big one is if a patient is failing a lot of those frontline prebiotic therapies. Some of those patients come to me and they say, look, I've done, um, you know, I've done a lot of prebiotics. I've been feeding, you know, my good guys for years now. I've cycled through all of the kind of, you know, top um, beneficial prebiotic fibers. I haven't seen great improvements. I'm still dealing with these symptoms. 
So we say, look, let's just jump straight to the case. Let's get you on a butyrate supplement. Let's get it up to a sufficient dose. See if you tolerate it. See if there are any benefits to it. And then once that kind of foundation is in place, then we'll try and slip the prebiotics under maybe a bit more of a broader fermentation profile, maybe a bit more of like a resistant starch, a colonic food, something like green banana starch or cooked and cooled rice, cooled potatoes, potato starch. They're fantastic res resistant starches that can feed a diversity of bugs in the large bowel. They can be a little bit more reactive. That's why I'd start off initially with a low FODMAP prebiotic, PHGG. You're gonna get sick of me saying that. We don't see good results with those kind of well-tolerated prebiotics. Uh, a butyrate supplement at a sufficient dose, see if there's a beneficial impact, and then over time, trying to wean them down off onto more of like a functional food, like a resistant starch. So that's a huge focus of the practice, getting butyrate up off the ground, looking for those downstream impacts, improvements on digestive health, and then trying to wean patients onto a diet that will keep feeding those good guys with those microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of this. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. And if you have any digestive health issues, you live in Australia or New Zealand and you're looking for help, then reach out to us here at the clinic. I'd love to hear from you.